Welcome to Walk About the Galaxy, the poetic astronomy podcast, where the science is universal, the opinions are personal, and the topics are far flung. We are Strange Charm and Top the Astroquarks, also known as Josh Caldwell, Patty Dove, and Jim Cooney. Coming to you from physically, but not socially, distanced locations near the University of Central Florida. Remember to check out our website to see how to get our snazzy shirts and subscribe to us on all platforms, including YouTube. You can contact us there or using hashtag AskWTG or email WTG at UCF.edu. Our stumpers today are spectral. Spectral? Like ghosts? Spectral. That's like what I was going to say. Harry Potter spectral? No, uh, more the scientific uh, spectral. We use spectra to figure stuff out in astronomy. It's an amazing tool. Uh, so, Jim, I'm cu very curious to hear your take on this one. I've chosen okay. just for you. Maybe you can figure out why. Infrared or ultraviolet? Uh, that's a tough one. Um, is uh, bottom cork's not in the room there with you, is she? Bottom cork is not in the room, and so I'm okay. going to go the other way. She she studies stuff in the infrared, so I'm going to go for ultraviolet. Not because I'm going to go a different way than her, but it's it's higher energy the. Uh, ultraviolet light has more energy than visible light or infrared light, and uh, though and bigger is... I'm not high energy, I'd like to be. So, <laughs> well, the um, the the sort of things that you learn about stuff depends on what wavelength you're looking at it. Like in yeah. in in my area in planetary science, infrared spectroscopy is used to like look at surfaces of asteroids or the moon. The moon and maybe figure something out about the mineralogy of it and but it's also all wrapped up with like how big are the grains and like changing all that stuff has all these subtle effects on the the infrared spectrum that's wavelengths of light colors of light that are redder than what we can see with our eyes and the ultraviolet as he says higher energy photons and they're due to sort of higher energy processes such as electronic transitions in molecules and atoms that emit those photons. So it's not so much, um, uh, it's, it's produced by sort of different excitation mechanisms in things. So mm -hmm. like I worked on an ultraviolet spectrometer. Ah, that's what I was gonna say. I was gonna earn uh, brownie points with you because you were yes. part of the uh, ultraviolet. Well done. On the, Is that the, when you were at right. Colorado? On oh, Colorado, working on the Cassini mission. <laughs> uh, and so that, is really useful for looking at things like magnetospheric emissions and emissions from the upper atmosphere, like aurora and, and stuff like that. So there are, you know, and then, I don't know, science, like any human endeavor that gets enough people involved, gets very clicky, you know? <laughs> True. And yeah. so there are all these spectral clicks too. Yeah. So there's a different sort yeah. of uh, spectral click that's related to your stumper, Addy, which yeah. is wavelength or wave number. Oh. Yeah, it's not a stumper wavelength. Okay, okay, good, good. Because I was going <laughs> to disown you if you went yeah. the other way. Yeah, like very, most people don't use wave number. There's only specific groups of people who use wave number. Uh, there's, but uh, there's a very... Educate very us, what is wave number? So wavelength is the thing most of the time we use to refer to like the wavelength of light, right? So you think of that as if, if it's an actual sort of sine wave that you're looking at, right? Sort of the length of the, the spacing of those waves. But like... Wave number is just frequency, but in weird units. Right. Because wave number is just like the inverse wavelength, but not divided by C or something, right? Yeah. The speed of light. So you don't, so it's just one over the wavelength. And it's like, why? But no, that's not, no. Right. The, fre <laughs> the frequency is C over the speed of light C over the wave C over length. wavelength. Right. Yeah. And that has a nice class, you know, physical meaning. It's like how many waves are passing you every second, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Wave number mm -hmm. doesn't have a, it doesn't mean anything really. So. Yeah. Right. It's, yeah, it's the. It's, it's an I inverse guess it's length the, units. <laughs> yeah. But there's definitely a very well-defined clique of people that are like, would, would fall on a sword to save wave number, you know, yeah. that like that in there, like, adamant that wave number is the only way that these things should be talked about, not frequency, not wavelength. Yeah. And it all just sort of comes down to all these different ways of describing numbers. You choose the unit that ends up with numbers that are sort of 
manageable, nice numbers to talk yeah. about, like numbers between one and a hundred or something like that. Right, right. And if your your numbers ended up being super super small, then you need a new unit. And if they end up being super super big, you need a new unit. Which reminds yeah. me of our trivia in our last episode, which was about funny units. Uh -huh. And uh, one of those funny units was the shot, which wasn't really that funny because it was just thinking of shot glasses. But uh -huh. one of our uh, alert listeners pointed out that a shot is also a, a somewhat arcane unit of length in shipping. In, in um, oh, I don't know, maybe shipping, shipping isn't the right word, but it's uh, a, a length between links and an anchor or number of links in an anchor chain. And oh, really? So yeah, oh. I, may have, I may have messed that up yet again, but uh, so. <laughs> Uh, there are all these all the, all these funny units, and they're usually just designed to end up so that you have a, a nice number that you can count on your fingers or something. Yeah, and that's what the right. wave number does. It's like it's not divided. It's not c over wavelength. It's one over wavelength because then the wave number is like fifty or a hundred. I don't even know. Like I don't even remember. I feel like at some atmospheric people use it. Like some chemistry people use it. Far ultraviolet. Know. Far ultraviolet. Okay. Um, so. On the Cassini mission, it was the the um, thermal emission ultraviolet. Uh, sorry, I said far ultraviolet. I meant far infrared. Oh, oh, that, makes that was a huge mistake. That was a huge <laughs> yeah. mistake. Sorry. It's like, do you oh mean extreme God. ultraviolet? Usually... That was a terrible. That was a terrible, terrible mistake. It's the uh, far yeah. infrared. IR, yeah. So what I would call like, you know, hundred micron stuff. Anyway. Yeah. Anyway. Well, today we'll talk about a missing black hole. Where'd it go? That's, that sounds kind We're of redundant. Black, black hole sounds like something missing already anyway. <laughs> uh, blue jet lightning and news about the red planet. But first, this episode of Walk About the Galaxy is brought to you by Sonnet One. Wisps of air that scarce provide life or heat blow with such acceleration they burn metallic skin on headlong rush to meet harsh surface where we hope so much to learn. Rocks and sand, dense, opaque, illuminate eons past to Supercam and Sherlock. X-rays and radar shine and penetrate the fog of history, turn back the clock. To stand or rather roll on barren plains with ingenuity to test the skies and UV lasers to dissect remains, find the perfect sample to later rise. O oh, perseverance, land safely on Mars, and further our dream of reaching the stars. Very nice. Very lovely, very, nice. very lovely. Very lovely what, indeed. Sonnet number one. Sonnet number one. Of many? Do you, do you plan on a, uh, a career so in far, sonnet? So far, so far of one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I discovered that the sonnet rhyming scheme, I, I'm fine with iambic pentameter, but the sonnet rhyming scheme, I'm not a huge fan of. Oh. Or I'm not, I shouldn't say I'm not a huge fan of it. I'm not particularly adept at it. Mm -hmm. Thus, you're not a huge fan of it. Which makes it, I'm not a huge fan of it when I'm writing it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, but you did a fine job. Sounded great. So a, our sponsor did a great job. Perseverance. Yeah. Perseverance. Uh, What's is, going on with that? Landing soon. It's landing in uh, less than three weeks, I think, or just about three weeks from when we're recording this in uh, the latter half of February. And it's landing on Yezero Crater. Yeah. Uh, I haven't talked about Percy in a while. It's been a little while. So it launched last summer. And it's it's another one of these seven minutes of terror descents. Yeah. Um, so that'll be exciting to watch. It's, you know, comes in... I, uh, I, I, wisps of air blow with such acceleration they burn metallic skin, and then parachute, not in and the sonnet. parachute, yes. <laughs> Sky crane, not in the sonnet, <laughs> all that stuff. But it's this crazy landing sequence, and uh, the rover is somewhat like Curiosity, right? That the if it's I very the similar, things yeah. right. Uh, but it has this sample caching um, Does. whole operation. It does. Where it's going to go uh, tootle around uh, the surface of Mars and pick up, it's going to like get rocks and it's crush them and it's got 43 sample tubes and it's pick stuff up, scoop them in there and it does some little onboard analysis to decide how that looks and how filled the tube is and fill some more stuff up. Um, and it's going to fill up, get collect a whole bunch of samples and then document Keep them. them. 
and yep. then it's going to, and then it deposits them at some point on, at some location on the surface. Um, this like is something I did. Hardcore geocaching. Yeah. It's aero caching, aero caching. Maybe. Yeah. Aries. Yeah. Um, stuff on Mars is. So I didn't, I didn't know like how they were actually handling the, the sort of caching aspect of it, but like whether it was just going to like be in the rover and then whatever the future yeah. mission that's going to bring this stuff back has not really been defined. No. Yeah. It's, it's this weird thing where this was originally part of a sort of a longer term scheme to do sample return from Mars, but then there was only funding up until this one, <laughs> basically. And they didn't really, but there is, there are teams working right now to sort of define the next steps. Yeah, I think NASA uh, and ESA are working together on a potential retrieval. So at the moment, they're just gonna like go get this stuff. I mean, the mission, Percy will be doing many, many other things. This is not its sole um, activity, of course, uh, but it's one of the newer, more interesting ones where it'll be collecting these samples, documenting them, and then putting them someplace that hopefully they'll also be able to like know precisely where that is. And that's going to be a place that'll be easy for this as yet to be defined future mission to go get those samples and bring them back to Earth. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. It'll be interesting. And then... Uh, it's, it's not the only Mars mission in the news. Not the only mission. So if we remember way back in the before time, well, no, during the... It was in the during summer. times, yeah. <laughs> during the during times. Uh, there were three missions that launched. So it wasn't just Percy. It was also, there's a Chinese mission um, that is going to also land on the surface. And they are, I think, going to try to um, do an orbit. I think they have an orbiter, though, too. So they're going to do an orbit insert, which I guess they need that to be able to do comms back, probably. Um, probably. So they're doing orbit insertion probably like February 10th-ish. And then, but they're not landing on the surface until May. And then the third mission is Was the Was there a rover or just a lander? I assume a rover. Every, everything roves now. You're, you're old school if you're just a lander. I think, well, they've just been so much doing, they've been doing so many things with the rover. Yeah, it's a rover. Tianwen-1. Okay. Yeah, they've, I mean, they've had some great success with their lunar rovers. So they've sort of, you know, that's a good test bed for these kinds of things. So mm. yeah. So the, and they're going to land in Utopia Planitia on Mars. Utopia Planitia. Is Sounds that familiar? It does sound isn't familiar. That, isn't that the place where they do the, they build the ships? It's a shipyard in Star Trek, right? Is Utopia that the Utopia Planitia place? shipyards. It is yeah. indeed. Yeah. It is indeed the Utopia yeah. Planitia shipyards of Star Trek. Why aren't we going there? Now so I'm really upset. Star Trek is they, they make <laughs> up, yeah, they make up names all the time, but sometimes they slip in like a real place or something like that. They do, uh, yeah. Which is yeah. Cool. So the, Chin the, the Chinese mission is going to discover or, or establish yeah. shipyards. Starfleet shipyards yep. uh, on Utopia Planitia. That's pretty exciting. That's awesome. That's good. That's good it stuff. Uh, and the other mission? And the other mission is the UAE Hope mission. Um, it is an orbiter, um, and it's built at the United Arab Emirates, but it's also a lot of the instrumentation um, and spacecraft stuff was built by the uh, Colorado Laboratory for Atmospheric and Space Physics, LASP. Also um, sounds familiar. Also sounds familiar. <laughs> hmm. So they are going into orbit, hopefully, on February 9th. I say hopefully. We were talking about this earlier. It's actually really hard to get into Mars orbit. I think like half of the missions that have been sent to Mars have successfully achieved orbit and or landing. But that success rate must be getting better and better as time goes on, right? Yeah. Or no? Probably. It I is. Mean, there, was, was, there was a bad there was a run. Bad sequence in the like 90s and 2000s. Late 90s, early 2000s. Yeah. There was, some, there was a series of, uh, of problems. There was the yeah. Mars, Mars Observer crasher. and then the Mars Polar Crasher. Um, yeah, so yeah. it's hard, but they have gotten better. And sometimes you just miss orbit. If you're trying to get into orbit, you just like miss it. Because it's like Mars isn't that big and it's really far away, but it has gotten better. Okay. And like, right, and so China hasn't sent a spacecraft to 
uh, Mars before. That's I don't correct. Think. And the UAE Certainly has not either, a lander. But the UAE yeah. partnered with LASP so that there's heritage and there's experience and stuff like that. So. Right. And uh, LASP uh, is also where the Mars MAVEN mission uh, mm -hmm. is led from there. It wasn't built there, but some of the instruments and, and the yeah. lead science scientists are at LASP. And the HOPE mission from UAE is an atmospheric mission like the MAVEN mission. And um, one of the interesting things about Mars, we're always sort of teasing the community about how many times we discover water on Mars, uh, because <laughs> we're always looking for water on Mars. But it's obvious that water did flow on Mars at some point in its past in big quantities. There were lakes, there were rivers, you know, there may have been flooding events and things like that. The whole history of that we don't really understand super well in terms of like, was it just nice and lovely for a billion years or were there just these sort of occasional bursts of warm periods triggered by yeah. some sort of dramatic climate change. But now, of course, Mars is cold and there's no liquid water and a large part of that is related to the loss of its atmosphere. And yeah. so um, a lot of these missions such as MAVEN and the HOPE mission are really trying to understand what are the processes about at the current time, at least, about how stuff is leaving the atmosphere, um, which helps sort of put together the the story of the history of the the climate history of Mars. Our two neighbors have pretty scary climate histories, Venus and <laughs> That's Mars. Right. That's right, yeah. You know, in very different directions. It really gives sort of, a, you know, extra yeah. meaning to that phrase, the Goldilocks zone, which we talk yeah. about when we're looking for exoplanets. We're just right. Just right, yeah. Um, there are two Starlink launches this week. That's too many. And three um, in the in this month in February. Yeah. Uh, so just another 180 Starlink you know. satellites. So I guess those don't really qualify as space news anymore. But um, <laughs> <It's old hat. laughs> just, yeah. Uh, but there are the next two serial numbers of the SpaceX Starship have been Ooh. spotted out oh, at yeah. uh, Boca Chica. Oh Texas. yeah, there's been all this drama because they were like gonna launch and then they haven't. It's turned out like they didn't get their FAA license ahead of time. I was which is yeah. super weird. It is super weird. It's usually um, for licenses you like sort of have it set ahead of time for a range and then right. you go when you can. But I guess they like hadn't gotten their set but they were gonna do it anyway maybe. Yeah so serial number nine is the next one up. And serial number eight, if, uh, if you haven't seen this, I encourage you to go on YouTube and uh, search for Starship serial number eight test flight because, and watch the whole thing because it's, it's pretty amazing and uh, dramatic, um, sort of a moderate to high altitude test flight. So serial number, and it didn't, it was, had a lot of successes, but came in a little bit fast at the end. Rapid uh, descent. <laughs> so I'll be curious to see how serial number nine does. Um, yeah. Let's see, there's some, there's some uh, human space flight news too. Yeah, there's, uh, I think we, we mentioned last time that the Starliner, the next Starliner test flight has been scheduled. Um, That's coming up in March. That's the Boeing human uh, equivalent to the Crew Dragon. Yeah. Um, there's a company called Axiom Space um, that's been around for a few years now. I don't like really know what they do, but they are putting together a private crew to go to the space station. So this will be the first private astronauts that's a whole crew to go to station. So they're riding on Dragon, on SpaceX Dragon, which is an autonomous vehicle. So you actually don't have to have somebody who's super well trained in how to use it. Um, but they but, do have, the, the commander of the mission is an ex-astronaut. Um, why do you need another company to crew a thing that's not? That's well, they're, I mean, I think it's I like think a they're buying agency, a ride. Kind of. Yeah. Yeah. So these four people are paying SpaceX money. for a ride to the space station. And they're paying NASA also. This is what the same kind of model that they've talked about Tom Cruise doing. Tom Cruise and a director, you know, it was, we learned a year or more or so, we're talking about filming some 
part of some movie, you know, an a, a presumably a, a, a drama, a, an actual sort of, you know, Hollywood style movie, not a documentary, not like an IMAX Tom Cruise explains the space station movie, but <laughs> some drama in the space station, they pay a fee and they go up there because now it's a private company that handles transportation to the space station. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, you yeah. know, it, it's not NASA that flies people to the space station to and from on shuttle. It's SpaceX. And so NASA buys flights to take their astronauts to the space station. But now Axiom has bought a flight to take their crew to the space station. Of course, they got to make sure that NASA's like, let's check our availability. You know, NASA's got to like, wait, what, <laughs> what are your dates? The- <laughs> what are your dates? Let's see. Okay, April 3rd to April 10th. Okay, I'm sorry. We can give yeah. you two doubles on that, those yeah, dates. Yeah, got to get the main service in and out of there. Yeah. <laughs> right. Your Airbnb so, isn't booked on that day. Yeah. Um, you know, it's fully, yeah. fully refundable up to, you know, 72 <laughs> hours before launch. That kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, so that's what's going on with that. It's yeah. interesting. And I think that company, Axiom, is working on facilities that would be in space as well. So, so like maybe sort of along the lines of Bigelow, where they would be building their own sort of habitats in space that uh, then companies like SpaceX would provide transportation to. So it's the very uh, early sort of, you know, glimmerings of this kind of space economy. It's a a hell of a time to be alive if you're mega rich. Yeah, Yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) It's it's fun for us to talk about it. (laughs) None of us are going to get to do that, unfortunately. But uh, maybe some of our listeners are mega rich and they can do it and they can tell us about it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, And then our last bit of space news was uh, OSIRIS-REx. Uh, our intrepid asteroid explorer, which has collected a sample from Bennu, uh, I guess they've they've planned their their return home. They have, and they're going to stay at uh, Bennu a little bit longer and do some additional imaging um, of the asteroid and of the site where they landed before and all of that. Um, but they're going to, but they have planned their uh, their return home. And I think they're scheduled to deliver the sample to Earth on September 24th. Of 2021. Okay, exciting. 2023. 2023. Oh, oh yeah. you <laughs> Less teased exciting. me. So I was so excited. Less exciting. That was a tease. <laughs> that was yeah. a tease. <laughs> it takes a little while to get back. They're going to depart uh, Bennu in May of this year and uh, then work their way back. Okay. They got to climb uphill to get back. Just kidding. They have to sort of, it's sort of in some sense climbing downhill, which gravitationally yeah. is also harder frequently than climbing uphill. Yeah. Like it is in real, like climbing down can be scarier than climbing up. Yeah, climbing up, uh, it's very hard on your heart and then climbing down is very hard on your knees. So I don't know if, uh, I don't know if, if uh, Osiris Rex has knees, but it's gonna be tough on there. <laughs> yeah, I guess I don't really know like what Orex has been doing for the past month or so couple months i guess it's just been hanging out not really doing stuff because they're gonna make but they're gonna do another flyby of Bennu and try to look at the site where they did the sampling i'm gonna guess they were they've been taking pictures in spectra probably but like i I feel i i mean the articles i was reading and and this stuff i've heard is just like they're not super close to it right now i don't think like they backed off pretty far after they did the sampling event and so i don't think that they've been like because they're talking about doing a flyby before they leave, which means that they're not super close right now to get like high res images. Okay, cool. Well, I'm gonna drop the trivia, the suite of trivia questions on you now, and then we'll talk about the missing black hole. Um, Okay. And I gotta redeem myself. Uh, Eddie absolutely crushed me last time, so. She did. Yeah. Uh, I feel like you did pretty well the previous time though. As I'm fond of doing, we have multiple parts. The, the theme of this episode's trivia are, is constellations. Uh-oh. I'm, I'm, maybe I'm thinking about constellations. I've got constellations on mine because I've got a new telescope arriving. Oh. I was, it's arriving months sooner than I thought it would because there are all these delays uh, associated well, with the pandemic. Uh, so these are super I simple. I ordered a knife back in June and I got it last week. <laughs> Wow. Okay. Uh, the these uh, questions are simple conceptually. Um, they're trivia. What is the largest constellation in the sky? Mm, okay. I'm going to give you in terms multiple of like choice. Area. 
Yes, in terms of area on the sky. Okay. Uh, your choices are Virgo, Hydra, Ursa Major, Hercules, Pegasus, and Scorpio. Okay. Uh, your next question is going to be, what's the largest constellation in the Zodiac? And your choices for that are the 12 constellations of the Zodiac. Mm -hmm. uh, and then finally, what is the smallest constellation in the sky? And I'm going to read your choices for this because I want to be able to read them as many times as possible because <laughs> I find them hilarious. All right, you ready? There's choices for smallest constellation in the sky. Scutum. <laughs> In case you didn't catch that, that was Scutum, <laughs> Sextens. In case you didn't catch that, that was Sextens, <laughs> Triangulum. <laughs> I've had Sextens of times. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> High five. <laughs> the triangulum jokes? Crux. I don't have any, no, Triangulum, I'm not kidding. Crux. Sir, uh, this one I don't know how to pronounce. Circinus. 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 You're an astronomer, Josh. That's embarrassing. And finally, <laughs> reticulum. <laughs> <laughs> so, scutum, hmm. sextens, reticulum, triangulum, crux, and circinus. Like circinus okay. maximus. Kind of, or certainness, minimus. Sure. All right. One of those is the smallest constellation. I want to give it some other details. We'll give you some other trivia once we have their answers about okay. just how small and just how big the smallest and the biggest constellations are. And it's kind of surprising. Okay. Is this defined by like, because like the, the sky square, deg is square degrees on the sky? Square but is degrees. It based on that, like, sort of outer bounds that they define on it's some the, maps there, where there's like the 88 boxes. There are 88 boxes. 88 okay, right. boxes that are, that are actually each box looks like a combination of boxes. Sure. Yeah. They're um, not boxes. But, they're but shapes. But they're, they're but blocky. It's, it's always they're so tetris surprising uh, to people when I'm te teaching Astronomy 101 or something. I mean, we think of the constellations as just those like stick figures that you draw the, the right. hunter or the whatever. But in reality, in modern astronomy, there it's defined as a region of the sky bound by these very complicated boundaries, um, right. and it's just like a yeah. landmark kind of a thing, you know. Like it's sort of like political, you know, boundaries, like country yeah. or state sure. or county boundaries, right, um, sure. and it's and it's just used for like what part of the sky. And it is ridiculous that they're not all the same chunk. Like, yeah, yeah, you know, they're, they're, for countries, it's like oh. Right. <laughs> That's right. They're heavily gerrymandered because yeah. for countries, it sort of like makes sense. Oh, there's a river here. There's a, a you know, an ocean or a mountain range. Most or something. of the time it makes sense. Things yeah. like that. Yeah. Well, too frequently it doesn't. But, um, but for the sky, it's just like, it's just directions. So yeah. why not just divide it up into a whole bunch of even pieces of pie? Yeah. You know? uh, but we, no well, it's you. more colorful this way. We wouldn't have it this interesting. Fun there you go. trivia exactly. about the, the largest and the smallest, and I wouldn't get to say scutum. <laughs> you might. It might also still be named that. Maybe. We could keep yeah. those names. Yeah. Well, uh, jumping way out now into the cosmos, there we've uh, been talking frequently. We love talking about supermassive black holes. And recently we talked about detecting the gravitational wave signature of supermassive black holes swirling around each other out there in the cosmos. Um, and these supermassive black holes tend to show up in the centers of galaxies. It's just kind of like, like the Milky Way's got one, not as these things go, not a particularly huge one. But it's kind of like every, you know, there's a galaxy, there's gonna be some big black hole in the middle. Yeah, yeah, in recent years, we've kind of taken it for granted that every, every large galaxy, and this isn't true for those little, little like dwarf galaxies and things, but every, significant galaxy in the universe has at its heart a supermassive black hole. But Not the dwarf galaxies are insignificant. Not that they're insignificant. I love them. Uh, the large Magellanic Cloud is a beautiful thing, as is this small oh, yeah. Cloud. We were, uh, we were watching a talk recently where it was a pulsar map, and it's like mostly things tracing the galactic plane, but then, isn't this what it was? Yeah. Yes, it was, but yeah. Mm -hmm. It was mostly things tracing the Arctic plane, and then there were these little dots over in the bottom part of the map, and you're like, oh, those are the Magellanic Clouds. 
Yes. If you're lucky enough uh, to be a listener in the Southern Hemisphere, then you get to see those on a regular basis. They're visible yeah. to the naked eye. Uh, unfortunately, One of so for, many reasons you're lucky to be in the Southern Hemisphere. It, it, yeah. <laughs> um, but for us in the Northern Hemisphere, I've never seen them. Me I've neither. Never there. Me neither. But, nope. We should all uh, make a voyage. Yeah. But those tend to be, you know, those, those tend to have millions or tens of millions of stars and just be these kind of irregular-ish small satellite galaxies of the bigger galaxies. The bigger ones are the ones with these supermassive black holes at their hearts. Uh, and we just kind of assumed that essentially all of them would have that, but we've recently found a really big, huge galaxy, which apparently does not have a supermassive black hole at its center. Is it just hiding? Well, probably. Oh. But we don't know where, right? Hi. So the, uh, Is it hiding in the galaxy or is it it run off somewhere into, to say. into galactic space? Tough to say, because we, we, yeah, we can't see it. We can't find it. So this is, <laughs> Uh, you know, this is this is a huge galaxy, at, which is the largest galaxy in a, uh, a cluster of galaxies. Uh, there are whole bunches of clusters of galaxies out there. They're labeled by the instruments used to find them and so forth. This is Abel 2261 is the uh, galaxy cluster. And the biggest galaxy in that cluster is called A2261 BCG. Um, yeah, it is. And <laughs> that's... <laughs> Uh, it's a huge elliptical galaxy, so very, very unlike oh. our own Milky Way. Our own Milky Way is this, you know, beautiful swirling thing with spiral arms and so forth. Elliptical galaxies are kind of, if you take a bunch of spiral galaxies and collide them over the course of billions of years, what you end up with is this much less organized mess of a huge cloud of stars. They sort of look uh, like a big egg. I mean, they, they're not, right? Right, right. About elliptical. Yeah, I mean, it's, they're, they're not... Uh, they're not organized in the way that a spiral galaxy is, but they they have a certain sort of triaxial symmetry and a yeah, beauty yeah, a beauty like, of their own. They do absolutely. They're 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 not as exciting to look at pictures of, for example, because you you don't see the the bands and the, all that kind of fun stuff. But they're so they're just kind of like a big pile of stars. But they are very interesting in their own right, and they take they can be huge. The very biggest galaxies in the universe are these giant elliptical galaxies with trillions of stars. Presumably um, because they're mergers of smaller galaxies. Is that why right. they're that's the right. biggest ones? Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, and they tend to, they, there tend to be one big one at the, at the heart of each one of these big clusters of galaxies that is probably the result of the a merger of a bunch of smaller galaxies. Um, so and they tend to right, have just monster to... black holes in the center of them because a lot of times when galaxies merge, their central black holes will merge. That's something we talked about a little bit last week, uh, yeah. in last week's episode. Um, so trillions of stars is on the order of like 10 times as many as the Milky Way. Right, right, right. So these are the, the, the universe's biggest galaxies. And their central black holes tend to be even, uh, you know, bigger than the Milky Way is by an even greater factor. I think our central black hole is supposed to have a mass of something like 4 million times the mass of the sun. Mm -hmm. uh, we expect it in this galaxy, A2261 BCG, to there to be a uh, something big cranking galaxy, <laughs> big cranking galaxy, uh, a black hole of something on the order of ten billion times the mass of the sun. One of these really whopper okay. uh, things. But when we look at the light coming from the center of this galaxy, we don't see any evidence of a supermassive black hole. So well, so you first have to remind us why we would see light as an evidence for a black yeah, hole if right. the hole is really black. It's really black, exactly. Well, it's because of its gravitational influence on its surroundings, right? So it's going to pull a whole bunch of stars that live near the center of the galaxy close to it. Now, it'll actually do kind of two things. Over a long period of time, it'll take all those stars that are close to the center and kind of spread them out more evenly than they were spread out. So you end up with this kind of big plateau of light everywhere towards the center of the galaxy. And then right near where the black hole is, you get a, a bright spot where it's kind of really mixing and messing with the stars that are very close to it. Um, and so you see this little cusp of light right near the center of the galaxy. This cusp is absent in this galaxy. In fact, there's a little dip in light at the center of the galaxy where it might have been, but it is no longer. So it seems to, it's, one possibility is it's there, but it's just gone totally quiet. And so it's like not eating mm. any stars anymore. There are no stars in the immediate vicinity of it. That doesn't seem likely, but it's possible. It's sort of like cleared out the area enough that everything else is a little everything bit far, far yeah. away. And but so. that doesn't make it, I mean, I don't know. That, that doesn't make a ton of sense. It's, it's those things are, are gravitationally powerful enough that there still should be some stuff there. I think yeah. the other possibility is the more exciting and cool one is that it got Ooh. ejected. What? 
that it was there, but it got ejected. It argued with the ump. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. You're out of here. Get out of there. Because when we're, we were talking uh, before about these collisions of supermassive black holes, mm -hmm. sometimes fun things can happen in those collisions. I mean, always one of the things that happens is you release huge amounts of gravitational waves as these supermassive black holes spiral around each other, and then a really big whop in amount of gravitational waves when they actually collide, if they do. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times when we think of those things, we think of kind of uh, symmetric-ish type of collisions, but they don't have to be symmetric. You have very different mass black holes that collide. And in some types of asymmetric collisions, the release of gravitational waves can be asymmetric or anisotropic is the uh, fun sciencey word for it. That is not the same in every direction, which would basically cause a recoil of the black hole. So the gravity uh, went out one way. That's cool. And then the, other, and then the black nice. hole shoot out the other way. Um, and so it could be that that black hole is making its way. It's, it's, it might still be in the galaxy and just making its way out from away from the center, or it could have been ejected entirely by now. OK, um, so let me just make sure I understand this right. So what you're saying is it's having a, it's having a dance with it. I mean, so a, a scenario is an interaction between two supermassive black holes that in the, those interactions be, you know, because mass and general relativity is this distortion of space time. So it's this rapid, you know, changing of the shape of space time in this vicinity as these two things are interacting because they're both incredibly amount of mass and incredibly small space. Mm -hmm. It's changing rapidly, and that uh, sends waves in, you know, what we sort of terribly call the fabric of space-time. Right. Uh, sends waves of, in of space-time, and of course, any wave is going to be carrying energy. And if that energy has a preferential direction, yeah. if something's going one way, something else has to go the other way, and That's the right. only thing that can go the other way is actually one of those things. Or and both of those things. Both of the things. So yeah, that. So the, the, the two it, things it and would get shot off the other direction, right? Um, that's it, cool. It is cool. It's it's not something <laughs> that we've observed before, but it's something we've modeled, yeah. and uh, and it's 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 something that the models say can happen. Uh, Why would what would cause it to go? What would cause an anisotropic gravitational well, I, and wave I don't, event to emerge? I, I don't. I think if you have just very differently sized black holes so that um you know at, at the kind of moment of collision there's a lot you know more momentum one way than the other way i i don't know the details of it enough to, to okay say, but, but we need to find the paper and read it okay um one of the yeah, early papers cool about this collision and the sort of two uh massive black holes forming at the center of a galaxy was actually by mitch bagelman josh I, th I saw that, yeah. One yeah, of our, uh, our our former professor at uh, yeah. CU. Since we're Colorado. dropping since we're dropping names, Jim, you mentioned yeah. that this uh, galaxy's name is Abel uh, was is in an Abel cluster. It's a, it's, it was discovered or cataloged by George Abel, uh, who cataloged a whole bunch of these um, galaxies. And when I was a a wee lad, a teenager. I was at a summer science program led by him. Ooh, so the whole wow. six weeks uh, getting taught about basic astronomy and not so basic astronomy nice. by him. So nice. that so was we cool. this galaxy A2261 Caldwell then? Yes. No, <laughs> no <laughs> nothing, nothing at all to do with it. But it, and of course, at the time, I didn't realize just sort of, you know, exactly who uh, he was and yeah. his importance in, in the field. It's like cool. later, it's like, oh, there are all these things Got named, stuff after, named after him. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's yeah. pretty cool. Great, the, the, yeah. It's so, cool thing. Go ahead. Anyway, I was going to say, we, we hope to, to learn more about this. I mean, uh, part of the problem is this is a very distant galaxy. This galaxy we're talking about is, I don't know, two and a half billion light years away or something, uh, which means that, you know, our resolution of it and so forth is not so great. It's very dim and, and, and so forth. So we've been using the Hubble Space Telescope to do a lot of these things. And then we use some other telescopes as well, radio telescopes and X-ray telescopes, the Chandra X-ray telescope to look at this thing in other wavelengths to see if we could see any fun things. And, and there are a few kind of bright blobs in this galaxy that it's possible that one of those harbors the, uh, the black hole, but we need 
a better instrument. And actually, the better instrument is on the way. The, uh, the James Webb Space Telescope should, uh, you know, Hubble, you could do the, the things we need to do with Hubble, but you would need hundreds of hours of uh, exposure time with Hubble, whereas uh, the, the new James Webb Space Telescope should be able to do it in a much shorter amount of time. So uh, we're excited to look at this. I say we, I'm not on the team, but they're excited to look at this with, the, with James Webb once that gets online. We'll yeah. be excited to read about it. Because this thing and, was actually discovered like 10 years ago, or not yep. discovered, I guess, as the case may be. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but so people, yes, yeah, people use Sophia and Hubble and radio telescopes, all these different assets to try to find it. Right. right. And James Webb Space Telescope launch is inching closer to us. Yeah, they, it's still scheduled for 2021, which, uh, you know, every, we keep. You know, That's the closest these, we've been. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one of these comical <laughs> things. We keep moving it ahead, but it's it's been set in 2021 for quite a while now. So, yeah. Fingers crossed. We're, we're in the year of launch. So yeah, yeah that's that's exciting. Well, uh, to sort of bring us back towards uh, home and our trivia, there was a cool observation. Speaking of uh, observations and looking at things from orbit, that's what I'm going to use as my segue. Okay. Good job. To, good job. Uh, observations from the International Space Station. Yeah. There was, we like to talk about, well, I do at least, like to talk about um, upper atmospheric phenomena sometimes. We've done articles and things like Steve and jets um, mm -hmm. and sprites and elves up in the upper atmosphere. And it's all these weird upper atmospheric phenomena that have to do with some electrical activity typically, and they emit sort of bursts of light in different uh, wavelengths and wave numbers. Um, <laughs> And there was a new, there's a newer paper out about um, some of these observations. Uh, one of the great things about the station is that it has down looking cameras um, that are just sort of like observing the atmosphere all the time. Um, but they also have some specific dedicated cameras on the ISS to look for things um, like storms um, and jets. Uh, and they, for, they saw a cool new detection of, a, um, of lightning called a blue jet um, that actually goes up from a thundercloud into the stratosphere um, and it can go up like 50 kilometers in less than a second um, and so it, it excites stuff up in the stratosphere and when it excites nitrogen it makes a blue color so that's why it's called the blue, blue jet, jet the blue jet lightning yeah. blown yeah. away at how complicated the physics of the upper atmosphere is and, oh uh, man I, I don't pretend to understand it at all and what's cool i guess is that we don't understand like as a scientific community there's still yeah. a ton of stuff about our own, I mean, we're out here like trying to figure out what's happening two and a half million light years away, or a billion, uh, we don't even know yeah. what the hell's happening in our upper atmosphere. I love yeah. thunderstorms, they're awesome. Yeah. yeah, and part of that is like, these usually happen above thunderclouds. So like, you can observe them sometimes, but it's really hard to see how they work. But if you're looking at from the top down, you get new insight into it. So the space, yeah. space station offers these cool observations. Mm -hmm. Speaking of space station and lightning, um, one of some of the screensavers for the Apple TV are just these beautiful slow oh, yeah. flyovers of the Earth from the space station. And some of them you see thunderstorms and you can see the f flashing of lightning going off in these storms, which is really mesmerizing and cool. And of course, when we send spacecraft to other planets, sometimes we do see yeah. lightning, but we don't have the same data volume and mm -hmm. uh, sort of, you know, bandwidth from a yeah. mission like Cassini orbiting Saturn or Juno orbiting Jupiter that we can have like on the ISS where you can be taking, you know, 100 frame per second movies looking straight down from just a couple hundred miles up on the cloud tops where there you're sort of zipping by and, you know, you take yeah. pictures and you hope you get lucky enough because the lightning flash itself is a fraction of a second. So... But it's all, yeah, all the same yeah. There's some, there, yeah. I think a couple years ago, there was a bunch of cool pictures of lightning on Jupiter from Juno. Um, yeah. yeah, we've seen lightning on Jupiter and on Saturn as well. Um, mm -hmm. So yep. dis electric, electrostatic discharges are fun. All right, yeah. so let's, let's see what you guys think about the constellations. Of the 88 constellations, which is the largest? What covers the most... Uh, number of square degrees, the largest area of what uh, we lovingly refer to as the celestial sphere. Is it Virgo, Hydra, Ursa Major, Hercules, Pegasus, or Scorpio? I'll say right now, I don't, I don't have any good idea. I'm going to go with Hydra. You teach intro astronomy, Jim. Shouldn't you know? 
<laughs> You'd think, right? Um, I'm going to go with Pegasus. Pegasus is the uh, sort of mascot of UCF, but it is in fact Hydra. Ah, oh, wow. All right. You got it. Job, yeah, you got you it. You fooled us there. Hy I thought you were going to tell that issue was right there. Yeah, Hydra is uh, 1,303 square degrees, but it's a very funny, it, like Hydra is a sort of a serpent, right? Right. And it's a very funny shape uh, for a constellation, very long and skinny. It's more than 100 degrees along. Wow. So it's a long, skinny thing. It borders of the sky. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, bo it borders 14 other constellations. Ooh, that would be a um, fun trivia is how many, which con I guess now we know the answer probably, but yeah. Uh, I'm assuming that's the one that has the borders the most. Uh, but oddly, it only has uh, one bright star. Well, it only has one star that's brighter than third magnitude, even though it's the largest constellation huh. in the sky. It's sort of like the leftovers or something. Um, that's a weird show. Which, which is the largest constellation in the zodiac? It's Scorpio. Bar it's barely smaller than Hydra. Scorpio. Uh, Capricorn. Virgo. Oh. Which I is... That, that uh, was on your list for the other one. Well, you know, what I could put whatever I want on that That's list. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> Virgo is 1,294 square degrees. Uh, and how about the smallest constellation? Don't forget your choices. They are <laughs> Scutum, Sextens, Triangulum, Crux, Circinus, and Reticulum. Uh, wait, what was, what was the second one? Sextens. Okay, what was the third one? <laughs> the third one is Triangulum. Oh, that's stupid. <laughs> scutum. Scutum? Uh, scutum? Scutum. I don't know if it's Scutum or Scutum, and I certainly don't scutum. know how to pronounce C-I-R-C-I-N-U-S, which is, I should uh, educate crux. myself. Jim is on a roll. He's a, he has yeah. gotten his vengeance that he promised right. from uh, our last episode. <laughs> two for two. Nice. Well done. It nice. is Crux, which is a scant 68 square degrees. So uh, compared to 1,300 for the two big ones we talked about, it's in the southern sky. And it's the southern, it, Crux meaning cross. And there's a little southern cross little tiny one. asterism. So even though it's the smallest constellation, it has five stars brighter than third magnitude, <laughs> whereas Hydra, the largest constellation, only has one. Huh. That's um, crazy. Which, uh, which is the smallest constellation in the northern hemisphere? I have no choices for you on this one. Is it in the previous options? It's not. Booties. Ophiuchus. <laughs> It's something I have never even heard of before. Ooh, is it the dolphin one? No, it's like a little horse, Aquelius, E-Q-U-U-L-E-U-S, which is uh, 72 square degrees and no bright stars. Why is it a constellation? Oh. I don't know. Why are these things are constellations? I don't know. It's got no bright stars and it's tiny. Do they used to have a bright star or something? Why isn't it just parts of some other constellations that are next door? Yeah. It doesn't make, it doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. You should just go. Jeez. Okay. Well, congratulations, Jim. You Thanks. get 3,000 points for winning today's oh, trivia yes. questions. That's so many That's points. A lot That's today. Great. Yeah. All right. Well, it may have felt like the time to fly to Mars. It was just another episode of Walk About the Galaxy. If you're still listening, you must like us enough to give us five stars everywhere. Stars are given. So go for it. Be sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram to get all our updates and check out our website at walkaboutthegalaxy.com. Subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can see most of our episodes, some of our bloopers, and all of our music videos. Catch up on old episodes wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on Twitter at walk underscore the underscore galaxy. And ask us questions anywhere using hashtag AskWTG. Our theme music was composed by Richard Jerusik. Thanks to our listeners in Arizona and around the world. Stay safe. I'm Josh Caldwell. I'm Addie Dove. And I'm Jim Cooney. We're the Astrocorks signing off until the next episode of Walk About the Galaxy. Good em. <laughs>